Okay, I think we'll make a start. Today's lecture is about phase field modeling. And I warn you, it's going to be a little bit difficult. Now, you've got your lecture notes which contain everything. So if you want, you can just pay attention to what I'm going to say. Okay. Um, until now, we've dealt with the kinetics of transmission by looking at a precipitate inside a matrix. And there is this interface between the matrix and the precipitate. On one side, we identify the precipitate. On the other side, we identify the matrix. And this is uh, effectively a two-dimensional object which separates the precipitate and the matrix. And then we work out free energies, kinetics, etc. Right? So this is the conventional way of dealing with growth kinetics. But supposing that we could represent the entire system by a parameter, which we call the order parameter, phi, order parameter. So we're plotting that along here. And when the order parameter has a value 0, it represents the, uh, the precipitate. When it has a value 1, it represents the matrix. And when it's in between, it represents the position of the interface. Okay. So the order parameter is simply a way of describing the state that we are referring to. Then, supposing we could find a function, G, which represents the free energy of the entire system, or, or the free energy at a particular point, as a function of the order parameter. Then, if we integrate that G over the entire volume of the material, then we have a complete description of the free energy of that system. Yeah. And then we could model kinetics by minimizing that free energy and letting the system evolve according to the minimization of free energy. So we have just one parameter to describe the whole system, which is the order parameter. Of course, it varies with position. We would be able to calculate the free energy as a function of that order parameter and integrate that over the whole volume so we get the total free energy. And then all we have to do is minimize the free energy to allow the system to evolve. And the interface itself can be regarded as a phase, effectively. And in this model, it can be a wide interface or a very sharp interface. So you can define the thickness of the interface. So for example, when we talk about spinodal decomposition, where you have a composition wave propagating through the system, you know, when, whenever you have variations in composition, that's like having a soft interface, an interface which is spread out. Yeah? So, you can even deal with diffuse interfaces in a model like this. So just to summarize, uh, we will represent the entire assembly of precipitate interface and matrix with an order parameter phi, which has a value of zero when it's the precipitate, and a value of one when it's the matrix, and the interface is at point five, phi equals point five. Uh, so this is the order parameter. We want to work out the kinetics of reaction, so we want to know how phi evolves with time. And it makes sense that the rate at which the order parameter changes will be related to how much the free energy, the G, changes as a function of the order parameter. So if the G doesn't change at all with the order parameter, then obviously the order parameter is not going to change, right? Does that make sense? Uh, and this is uh, uh, effectively a proportionality constant. Now, I'm going to state to you what this free energy functional G looks like, and then I'm going to explain to you how to derive it. And the derivation is quite long. Okay. So I wouldn't expect you to reproduce the derivation in the exam, but you do need to understand it if, you're going to, if it's going to sink into your brain. Yeah? So I will go through the derivation, even though it is lengthy. And this is what we are going to try and uh, demonstrate, that supposing we have a completely homogeneous system in which phi has the same value everywhere. Okay, so let's say phi corresponds to chemical composition. The composition is the same everywhere, then I can define the free energy as G0, which will be the same everywhere. So if, if the system is homogeneous, then this is our free energy, G0, with the subscript 0. But if the system is heterogeneous, that means we have variations of composition or crystal structure, 
Then we have to have this additional term here, which depends on the square of the gradient of the order parameter. That means you, you've got a gradient of composition. This term here depends on the square of that gradient. And this is called the gradient energy coefficient. And effectively, that's like having a soft interface energy. And of course, we need to integrate this over the entire volume of material so that we have the total free energy functional. A functional is simply a function of a function. And when we differentiate that with respect to phi and multiply by m, we get the rate of change of microstructure. Okay. So that's the basic principle. Uh, I haven't explained to you how I got to this equation, but I will do so in a second. But do you understand the basic concept of phase field modeling? So you don't locate an interface here, there, and everywhere. You simply define this functional, and you work out the rate at which the order parameter changes, and that automatically gives you the microstructure, because you're heading towards the minimum in G. Yeah? So that's the basic concept of phase field modeling. And we'll now go on to develop an expression for the free energy of a heterogeneous solution. So I'm going to focus on uh, spinodal decomposition because we have very clear variations of chemical composition. It's no longer homogeneous. And we've been drawing these free energy curves and free energy surfaces, and they were all for homogeneous phases. That means where everything is uniform. Now we are going to derive a free energy expression for a system which is not homogeneous. So there are variations of chemical composition. In principle, there can be variations of crystal structure or even strain. But we'll focus on chemical composition. Uh, so the question is, uh, for chemical composition, how does the free energy depend on concentration gradients? So everybody happy with the concepts? Okay. Uh, it's very easy. We've done solution models to find the free energy of a homogeneous solution. We are now going to find the free energy of a heterogeneous solution, which has variations of composition. Right, what is this? It's a Taylor expansion, and we're doing it uh, about, uh, about x equals zero in this case. So what I'm going to do is, we've got composition gradients, and we've got gradients of gradients. In other words, we've got dc by dx, which is a gradient of composition if x is distance, and we've got d squared c by the x squared, which is telling you how fast the gradient is changing. So we're not assuming that the gradient is uniform either. Uh, so we've got two variables for which I need to express g as a function of. Okay? Both dc by dx this is a concentration gradient and if you like this is the curvature of of that, okay. so it's how the gradient varies with distance. And for brevity, I label this as y and this as z. Okay. So these are the two variables, and I need to express g as a function of these two variables. Uh, in this case, we have just one variable, x. I need to do a Taylor expansion for two variables. So how do I do that? Well. This is it, but let's just go through it, okay? So we've got the g as a function of y and z. And just like we have j0, we have first here g0, okay? the first term, which is assuming that everything is homogeneous. Then we look at the second term, which has the derivative here and that. So we have plus and the second term will become uh, y uh, into, so th that y corresponds to this here. And the variation of g with y plus z into the variation of g with z. If I have more than two variables, I can continue in this direction. Okay. So, are you happy this corresponds to the first term in the top Taylor expansion? Then I add the second order terms. Uh, we have the half which comes from this 2 factorial here. 
So we have half into uh, the square of y. So y squared into d squared g by dy squared plus z squared into d squared g by dz squared plus 2 into d squared g by dy dz. Yeah. I'm not going to go beyond the second term. But do you see how we've done a multivariate Taylor expansion? It's basically very similar to the single variable Taylor expansion. Yeah. Now things will get algebraically complicated because I'm going to substitute for y, I'm going to use dc by dx, and for z, I'm going to use d squared c by dx squared. But I need to do that in order to simplify things. So instead of y, I will write dc by dx. So I get dc by dx. And similarly this becomes yeah. Instead of z, I will write d squared c by the x squared. Instead of y squared, I have the gradient squared, dc by dx, the whole thing squared. And similarly here, dc by dx squared. d squared c by dx squared. squared c by dx squared, all things squared. Okay, so there's nothing complicated that I've done. I've simply substituted for y and z in terms of the gradient and the curvature of that gradient. Actually, I forgot there's a mistake here, isn't it? Because there's a yz missing here. Mm -hmm. okay. So I need to add, add that. So 2 c by dx and d squared c by dx squared. So we've done a Taylor expansion of the free energy in terms of the gradient and this weight C by dx squared. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ignore all the terms which have cubes and more than cubes in terms of gradients and so forth. So this term, which has a dc by dx and d squared c by dx squared, I'm going to delete that term. Now this term here is exactly the same as this. It's, it's the free energy for a uniform uh, composition. If I write uh, kappa 1 as dg over d by dc dx, then I have this term here. So this first term is simply this one here. Can you see that? I've, I've simply replaced uh, everything except dc by dx by kappa 1. Right. So I can, I can just rub this out. Right that is kappa 1. Yeah. This term here, k2 into d squared c by dx squared, where 
kappa 2 is simply the variation of g with the curvature. So I can rub this term out here. Yeah, everybody happy with that? Except that I need to also incorporate this term in there. No, no, that's right. So that will correspond to K3 here. Yeah. We've got half d squared g by dc by dx squared. So this, um, if I remove that and I change that to K3, This also, yeah, this term, let me see, is really a part of this term. Yeah. It's got the same form, d squared g by that. So I can get rid of that term. And we've ended up with an equation which looks like this. Okay, so the free energy is a function of the gradient, the curvature of the gradient, and the gradient squared. Okay. What were you able to drop out the further uh, We are simply saying that look, the gradient may not be so large. If the gradient is not very large, you can drop the high order terms. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, if it is large, then you can't. Okay. So yes. just so. Yeah, it's just a Taylor expansion. Now, have a careful look at this, all right? This is the free energy. And this is the gradient of concentration. This is how the gradient varies with position. And this is simply the square of the gradient. Is there any way I can simplify that, correct? Remember that free energy is free energy. Is there any term there which shouldn't be there? So think about uh, sign, sign invariant. Obviously, if I change the sign here, it doesn't matter because it's in the square. Mm -hmm. But should the free energy vary if you change the sign of the gradient from this to this? It shouldn't, should it? Because, I mean, that's just the definition of coordinates. Right? If I redefine my coordinate, then I shouldn't get a free, different free energy. So this term uh, also disappears. Does that make sense? Free energy should not be a function of the sign of the gradient. Okay? But that depends on how I define my coordinate system. If I start x from here, then the gradient is negative. If I start x from here, the gradient is positive. Yeah. So this term can be eliminated as well. <coughs> so we end up with an equation uh, well, I want to integrate over the whole volume, and I'm getting rid of this term. So we end up with an integral over the whole volume of the uniform component, this term here, and this term. This is all we are left with at the end of the day. simplify this further because we've got uh, two of these terms and the equation that I showed you earlier only had the square of the gradient yeah. you know if I go back and show you the this equation we don't have a term in d squared c by dx squared we just have the square of dc by dx yeah. So we haven't completed our simplification process. OK, so here's that equation reproduced again. And I'm going to focus on this particular term here, okay, the integral of that term. Now, are you familiar with this integration by parts? Okay, so you've got, uh, you've got 
the integral of u and the derivative of v with respect to dx, then you can write it as the product of u and v less the integral of u dash v into dx. So this is a, a mathematical, um, what do you call it, a mathematical <laughs> statement, yes, that's right, which can be proved that if you want to integrate u v dash with respect to x, then that's equal to u v minus the integral of u dash v dx. So if you define this as u and this as v dash, then what is v? dc by dx, that's right. So the first term here is u and this is v, which is the integral of d squared c dx squared minus, uh, we need u dashed, right? So u, remember, is k2. What is u dashed equal to? dk2. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, I thought you might say dk2 by dc, but you correctly said dk2 by d x. Okay. But I'm going to write this as that is equivalent to dk2 by um, dc into dc by dx. Okay. So if I take dk2 by dc and one of those dcs by dx, then that's equivalent to dk2 by dx. And of course, the v is again dc by dx, so we have a square here. Can I get rid of anything there? We've got the same thing, haven't we? Yes. Yeah, we, we, not, we can't have that because if I change the sign of the gradient, free energy will change. Yeah? And that's not sensible. So I can substitute for the integral of this with a term which simply has the square of the gradient here. Yeah. So this term becomes very similar to this term. Yeah? So I've got rid of the d squared c by dx squared part by doing this integral. Yeah. <coughs> and therefore, I end up with my final equation, which I showed you at the beginning, that the free energy functional uh, over the entire volume is a uniform component plus a component which depends on the square of the gradient. So this is the square of the gradient. And in our case, we are talking about a composition gradient. So that will be the square of the composition gradient. And this is the parameter which contains all these, okay. the K3s and so forth, which we call the gradient energy coefficient. And that is effectively like having an interface energy in a system which is not homogeneous. Now, I did say to you that uh, I do not expect you to derive this equation. Yeah. It's long-winded and there's room for many mistakes on the way. But the basic concepts you should understand you know, about phase field modeling, that we are dealing with a single parameter which defines the whole system according to the value the parameter has, that we calculate the free energy of a heterogeneous solution, and the heterogeneity can be either chemical composition strain gradient, crystal structure gradient, whatever, or all of them combined together. But you find a free energy functional for that, and you integrate out of the whole volume, and then dg by uh, d phi, the order parameter, is related to the rate at which the reaction happens. Okay? So we have a complete model. And you've already seen some of the phase field simulations because when we were doing the morphologies of precipitates, I showed you computer simulations of how dendrites evolve. And those are phase field simulations. Yeah. So the shape came about automatically. You know, it, it, it wasn't uh, actually an input into the model. Let me see if I can find that, right? Yeah, yeah.
they did that them. You know, when you have so many files, yeah. it's all very well to have a big hard disk. But uh, are there movies? Okay, so this, this was one of the movies that I showed you. Yeah, that is actually a phase for simulation. We are not telling the system that, look, you have a shape of this over here, and you have a shape which looks like a, a columnar grain here, and so forth. The free energy is being minimized at every stage, d phi dt is being calculated, and you're plotting the results. And when we go to So that is uh, the growth of two phases together. You know, this is what we call a eutectic reaction. Yeah. Where you have uh, two phases growing at a common front. And all this branching and so forth is an automatic consequence of the phase field model. We're not telling the material at any stage that, look, now you should branch and your spacing should change and so forth. At each point, we are minimizing that free energy function. Okay. Uh, these movies are actually produced um, by colleagues of mine, um, public in Aachen University and Nestler, who is in a commercial setup where the cells are software. So that essentially is phase field modeling, and it completes the kinetics part of the lecture course. So do you have any questions? <coughs>